In this last mini lecture on the British legislature, I just want to say a, a few words about the House of Lords. Uh, Roskin doesn't really talk a whole lot about the House of Lords, but at one time the House of Lords was really co-equal. In fact, for a while the House of Lords was actually more powerful uh, than the Commons. Uh, in the last century or so, there were two acts uh, and really only one uh, that I may uh, ask you for exam purposes. Uh, I do want you to know the Parliament Act of 1911. Most people think that this is the most significant piece of legislation regarding the House of Commons uh, over the last 125 years or so. Uh, the Parliament Act of 1911 removed the power of the House of Lords to veto money bills and allowed them to put a two-year delay on regular legislation. Regular legislation would be legislation that does not pertain to finances in any way. The Parliament Act of 1911 uh, actually changed that to only one year. And of course, uh, even today, the House of Lords can still amend legislation or delay legislation, but now the Commons uh, can override an amendment by a simple majority vote. So in other words, if the House of Commons has already passed legislation, that means they've passed it by more than a majority vote, which means that the Commons can, in essence, discard objections by the House of Lords whenever they want. Now, that does not mean that the House of Lords does not have any role at all. Uh, obviously, the House of Lords still uh, is called the Upper House. Uh, you often have distinguished uh, politicians who uh, go and serve in the House of Lords. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, uh, Tony Blair, for example, both uh, served for a while in the House of Lords. Uh, the House of Lords at times has uh, suggested uh, amendments. Uh, they've uh, debated, and that's what they're really known for. They are known for debating controversial measures that often are not meaningfully discussed in the House of Commons. Uh, and at times, the prestige of the Lords has uh, gotten the House of Commons to uh, accept uh, the amendment. And I pointed out a couple. Uh, they're a bit dated. But I remember these uh, early in my uh, uh, teaching career. Uh, there were very robust, very significant discussions about abortion, uh, homosexuality, uh, uh, you know, interestingly. Uh, even though Margaret Thatcher was known as a very conservative prime minister, uh, she surprised a lot of people by coming out uh, in favor of gay rights, for example. Uh, your book doesn't point this out, I believe, but uh, the uh, House of Lords is a very rare unelected second legislative cham chamber. I put in your notes that there's only one other example of this in the world that I'm aware of, and that's in South Africa in Lesotho. So uh, the fact that there is this unelected uh, upper house is a, a very uh, rare uh, phenomenon indeed. I want to close out the discussion on the institutions by talking about the advantages of the British fusion of powers model. When I take a look at it, and certainly uh, as you read through this section on institutions, uh, you may have more. I actually have a, a longer uh, laundry list than this. But as I have studied Great Britain over the years and certainly have made lots of comparisons uh, to the American political system, uh, it seems to me that there are three things uh, that really stand out about the British fusion of powers model that I see as real positives. The first is that the majority party can implement its program quickly. And for voters, that's an excellent thing. As a voter, uh, if you have a political party tell you that if you elect us, we are going to do A, B, and C, you know with 97% certainty you're going to get A, B, and C. 
the majority party, whoever wins that election, is going to implement its program quickly. Elections have consequences. And so as a voter, when you hear a party promising things, you may either really like it or you may really, really dislike it. And either way, that is going to motivate you to get out and vote because you know that these two parties have very different policies, very different programs, and that whichever one of them wins is going to be able to do that. In the United States, you don't know if that'll happen or not. In the United States, being the majority party may not mean that much. For example, in the U.S. Senate, the minority party can lodge a filibuster. The party can prevent it legislation from getting passed unless the majority party has 60 votes. So it's not just enough to have a majority in the U.S. Senate. You have to have a super majority. You have to have at least three-fifths of the Senate in order to prevent these things. Or in the American political system, you may have Congress pass a law. The president may sign it into law. It may be challenged, and the U.S. Supreme Court may strike it down. In Britain, this does not occur. If the House of Commons passes a piece of legislation and it becomes law, there are no tests of constitutional. Remember, in Britain, there is parliamentary supremacy. In the United States, there is constitutional supremacy. The second advantage of the British fusion of powers model, I guess I've already mentioned it, the electorate knows who to reward or punish. The electorate knows who to hold responsible for programs. Uh, once again, that may not be true in the United States. Uh, the norm over the last half century has been what we call in the United States divided government, where one political party controls part of the government and the other political party controls the other part of government. For example, going into the 2020 election, the Republicans were the majority party in the Senate. The Democrats were the majority party in the House of Representatives. And so in that particular case, who do you reward or who do you punish? One political party controls one chamber, the other political party controls the other. And more often than not, uh, we have had divided government, either in the Congress or in many cases, the Congress belonging to one party and the executive branch the other. That doesn't occur in the British system. The prime minister and the cabinet are going to be of the majority party in the Commons, or at least the largest party in the rare case of a coalition. Third, in Britain, the role of the electorate is much simpler than in the United States. In Great Britain, the role of the electorate is to elect members to the House of Commons, and the House of Commons will then select the Prime Minister who will select the cabinet secretaries. In the United States, the electorate is expected to elect House members and senators and presidents. And the electorate may send a very mixed message. May send a, a Democrat to the White House and may send Republicans to Congress or vice versa. So I like the British fusion of power simplicity. I like the fact that the majority party can implement its program quickly. For voters, they know who to punish, they know who to reward. It is an easy to understand system. Now, of course, there are criticisms of this model. Some would say that the majority party can be dictatorial. There are no checks and balances in the British fusion of model system like in the United States. That's true. The United States is slower. It's more deliberative. In Britain, it is as easy to pass bad legislation as good legislation. All of those things 
are true. But I think the British model is easy to understand. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. We will move away in the next mini lecture from British institutions to the third component of British politics. We will talk uh, about parties uh, and elections and how elections have fundamentally changed in Britain over the last decade or so and why that may be the case. So I hope you're enjoying the course so far uh, and I will be putting new lectures in on British politics. Wonderful week, everyone. Take care. See you soon. Bye-bye.